They interact with each other. The uh, tartrate wraps itself around the cobalt ion in such a way that it is subject to attack by this uh, species produced by this hydrogen peroxide, resulting in its breakdown into these molecules of oxalate. But then the products can be released from the cobalt ion. And in the cobalt ion, when it's tied up with the tartrate, changes its color to that uh, brownish, greenish color. And then when the products are released again, the ions are uh, back in the free cobalt uh, ion form in solution. And then you see the pink color restored, which is then evidence, visual evidence, that the catalyst has not been consumed, but is restored in its original form. And if we had enough time, we could use that pink solution over and over again to keep this, uh, to demonstrate that, that the catalyst has not been chemically changed and that it can be recycled an endless number of times. Now, for the uh, final moments of the presentation, let's go back now from chemistry and re-enter the world of biochemistry and relate uh, catalysis again to an RNA system. And this is a very small catalytic RNA shown in the upper left-hand corner as this sort of steely blue color. This is the RNA molecule uh, that can act as a catalyst, but it doesn't have any molecule to interact with in the upper left-hand corner. However, it can bind another strand of RNA shown in pink, which is the one that's going to actually undergo chemical change. We call the pink RNA a substrate RNA. And once this complex is formed, in the presence again of a metal ion, so many biological catalysts, including these RNA catalysts, use metal ions. In this case, not cobalt metal ion, but perhaps magnesium or manganese ion, magnesium being a very common uh, plus two charge metal ion that's very common inside of living cells. In the presence of that metal ion, a chemical reaction takes place, the details of which are shown here, that results in what the artist has shown as a little explosion, uh, a demolition of this pink RNA strand at a very specific place. So the, the single RNA chain is broken into two product chains. Those cleaved products can be released, restoring the catalyst in its original form, and this uh, catalyst can then interact with the second substrate RNA and go around this cycle uh, perhaps hundreds of times in an hour, and uh, many other biological catalysts are, have a faster turnover number than that even. But the, the main point in terms of the principle is that the RNA catalyst is not changed in the process and can go through the cycle an endless number of times. So to recap what we've covered in the first lecture, we've decided, and you helped me decide, that the chemical reactions that we can demonstrate on a benchtop, uh, although there are some differences in terms of scale uh, and in terms of perhaps spontaneity and, and explosiveness compared to biochemical reactions, that there are uh, a lot of similarities between chemical reactions and biochemical reactions, and that biochemical reactions, uh, which are catalyzed by enzymes, which can be either protein in nature or they could be RNA catalysts, uh, operate according to principles that are very similar to the way that metal ions or a metal surface, in the case of the Lincoln penny, would catalyze a chemical reaction. Thank you. And I've been told that we have some time for questions from you, so please uh, speak up, speak loudly. Yes, in the middle. Okay, what is that? You are a molecular biologist, are you? The, I am, am I a molecular biologist? Yes. Okay. Because see, that's what I want to be. And what exactly, you 
you know, what a baby you besides what you have before to really go into that field? Just a curiosity or just... So the question was, what motivated me to go into molecular biology as opposed to some other sort of field? All of my training had been in chemistry, and in particular in physical chemistry, which involves the, uh, the uh, interaction and reaction of molecules in the gas phase uh, and a lot of spectroscopic interrogation of, of uh, the reactions in the gas phase. And interestingly, it was really my temperament which drove me away from that field and into molecular biology more than fascination with the scientific material. In biochemistry or molecular biology, you do an experiment and get an answer back from the experiment almost on a daily basis. Very quick, you get an idea, you can test it, you get an answer. Sometimes the answer is that you... Uh, don't get the answer that you were hoping for and you have to rethink the experiment. But there's this constant interplay between ideas, experimentation, back and forth. In many areas of non-biological chemistry, people spend months, even years, building a machine to test a particular idea. And I'm too impatient to wait around that long. So that was part of my motivation. Another question back here. Yeah, uh, what... What made you decide to uh, research RNA and specifically its catalyzing properties? So the question was, why did we uh, decide to research the catalysis by RNA? And the answer was that we didn't seek it out. Uh, it sought us out and found us, and you'll hear that story in the next lecture. Next door, yes. So it can also be addressed in the next lecture. I'm not sure. Are there any specific examples you might be familiar with of RNA acting as a catalyst, biological catalyst? So uh, what is a, an everyday example of RNA acting as a biological catalyst? I think the most important example in living cells has to do with the process of protein synthesis. The ribosome has been known for decades to consist of uh, three or four RNA molecules, but not just RNA, they are associated with a myriad of proteins as well, very specific proteins. So it hasn't been easy to ask the question, uh, is it the protein parts that are the enzyme factors and the RNA is just sort of serving as a scaffold holding things together, or is it the other way around? Is it the RNA that's the active component and the proteins are, are helping modulate that RNA activity? Uh, current opinion has swung in the direction of the ribosome being an RNA catalyst, uh, in part due to uh, some wonderful work that's been done in Harry Noller's laboratory at the University of California, Santa Cruz. The uh, final answer to that is, I'm sure, going to be that the ribosome works as a ribonucleoprotein particle. In other words, obviously, both the RNA and the protein components are essential, but at its very heart, the catalysis of transfer of a, an amino acid to a growing peptide chain appears to uh, be an RNA-catalyzed reaction. So that's, I think, the, wo the one example that is the most sweeping and the most central to biology. We'll talk about others later. Other additional questions? The uh, northwest corner has been very quiet. Does someone up there have a... Yes, down, down here. Uh, what are the drawbacks of doing research in molecular biology? What are the drawbacks? Do, do you want to expand on, on that? What, what do you have in mind? Well, um, are there any disadvantages? Like, what's the long, the long time you have to put into? Are there a lot of mistakes? Um, anything that you don't like about it? Uh, so so are the, what are the drawbacks to engaging in molecular biology research? Uh, Sure, there are long periods of time of frustration. I don't, when um, experiments aren't working, and especially if you're trying to do, understand things at the very fringes of, of knowledge.